Welcome to Big People Mini Bios. My name is Yuli Tsimbal, and on this podcast, I cover the mini biographies of influential, world changing individuals. Stick around to get encouraged and inspired. Today, I'm introducing you to a woman who was an influential missionary, author, and speaker in the 20th century. She did missionary work among one of the most violent and unreached people groups in the world. She authored 24 books that included themes on suffering, singleness, and biblical womanhood. She traveled and spoke all over the United States, inspiring and igniting generations of Christians. She was one of the very few female voices in the evangelical world during her time. Her name is Elizabeth Elliot. Chances are, most people don't know who she is anymore. Writing about Elizabeth Elliot, Joni Erickson Tata said, It's a different era now. Many young people I know don't recognize the name of Elizabeth Elliot. They live in an egalitarian culture where everyone's story is extraordinary, whether it has a stamp of Christ or not. The leaders they look up to lack heroic qualities. Courage is rare. Good character, rarer. Moral purity feels arcane. Suffering should be mitigated at all costs, and if it cannot be avoided, it must be drugged, divorced, escaped from, or prayed away. We may not know it, but in an age of anti-heroes, our souls crave an authentic witness. This podcast aims to introduce you to such authentic witnesses. Elizabeth Elliot is certainly one of them. But before I begin, I'd like for you to imagine for yourself which qualities and characteristics you would think would be ideal for a missionary to possess among native people living in the jungle. What may come to mind for some of you might be someone who is strong and muscular, able to brace the jungle and all of its dangerous creatures. Someone who is extroverted and outgoing, enough to comfortably join a community of people whose language and way of life is unknown. And someone who is rough and rugged, able to easily adapt to difficult circumstances like cold and hunger or strange foods like monkey flesh and tropical bird meat. Elizabeth Elliot, however, was not really any of these things. She was thin, poised, and elegant. She was introverted and preferred her privacy. She was feminine, tidy, and cultured, enjoying fine china and tea. Yet with these very qualities, God called her to missionary work. Perhaps you may think of yourself as not having the perfect set of characteristics for your ministry. If so, you'll draw encouragement from Elizabeth Elliot's story. Elizabeth Elliot was born as Elizabeth Howard on December 21st, 1926, in Brussels, Belgium, where her parents were missionaries. The Howard family then moved to Philly, Pennsylvania, when she was just a few months old. After the move to the United States, Elizabeth gained five other siblings. The Howard family's mornings consisted of a prompt meal at 7 a.m., followed by family devotions. During devotions, they sang a hymn, read the Bible, and a devotional from Jonathan Edwards or Charles Spurgeon. They prayed on their knees and finished with the Lord's Prayer. Their evenings followed the same routine. Even on big holidays like Christmas, the Howard family didn't miss out on their family devotions. You can see where Elizabeth Elliot got her self-discipline from, let alone her godly character. The Howard children were given an opportunity to learn creative writing and art through an idea Elizabeth's father, Philip Howard, came up with. He created a family newspaper and invited his children to contribute poems, stories, or cartoons. Perhaps this little family newspaper was Elizabeth Elliot's first inspiration to write and become the author we know her for today. I sometimes like to ask young couples what family traditions they want to start in their family. Hearing of the discipline and creative traditions of the Howard family makes you wonder what you can incorporate in your own to help prepare your children for serving the Lord. Elizabeth's parents raised their children to be exceptionally tidy, punctual, and organized. The children were taught that the strict rules were all part of their training to become eventual missionaries. As it turns out, four of the six Howard children did go on to become missionaries. It probably also helped that the Howard family frequently took in visiting missionaries who stopped by in the United States. Over the years, the Howard family had guests from 42 different countries. A young Elizabeth Elliot would constantly sit across from these missionaries and admiringly soak in their stories from the mission field. One such visiting missionary that had a deep impact on Elizabeth was Betty Stamm. 
Only a few years after visiting the home of eight-year-old Elizabeth Elliot, Betty Stam and her husband John Stam were beheaded by communists in the street of a village in China. With martyred heroes like the Stams, Elizabeth Elliot was exposed to the reality of missionary work from a young age. But instead of deterring her, it only intensified her desire to reach the lost. In 1941, a young, teenage Elizabeth Elliot boarded a train to go to the school of her dreams, Hampton Du Bois Academy, or HDA for short. This was a Christian boarding school in Florida. The school often received the children of well-known pastors and speakers, like Billy Graham. HDA was designed as a sort of factory for missionaries and Christian leaders, producing cultured and practically skilled men and women who could apply themselves in civilized society as well as in a jungle. At HDA, students had to promise to stay away from alcohol, tobacco, cards, dancing, the theater, and movies. If you're a Slavic listener on this podcast, this probably sounds just like growing up at home. As it turns out, it wasn't only the Slavic Protestant Christian culture that tried to distinguish itself from the world through such methods. But this didn't mean the students were left without any form of fun and entertainment. Their alternatives were to go for a swim in the lake, picnic underneath the palm trees, and play tennis or other sports and games under the Florida sun. Still, HDA was a serious school with lots of expectations, chores, and duties. Elizabeth Elliot, as well as students who graduated after her, remember HDA with mixed feelings. Some had to recover for years from the legalistic and overly critical environment. In spite of that, the boarding school was the cause of many of Elizabeth's important life lessons and fond memories. HDA was the place where she met her first boy crush, Paul. During her final years of high school, Elizabeth Elliot wrote in her journal, I wish she'd ask me to the banquet. I'll die if anyone else does. Paul ended up asking her to the banquet, and their relationship lasted into her first year of college or so. Now, if this sounds uncharacteristic of Elizabeth for you, entries like this actually surprised her too when she reread her journal. She hadn't remembered that she dated at all before her first husband, Jim Elliot, came along. But this gives a good glimpse into her life. She doesn't sound too different from any other regular teenager. She's actually quite relatable. This is also a good incentive for keeping your own journal. You may be surprised by your growth and when you take a look back at who you were and what you've been through. At her boarding school, Elizabeth Elliot was also introduced to the works of Amy Carmichael, an Irish missionary and writer in India. Through her writings, Amy Carmichael became one of Elizabeth Elliot's first mentors. Elizabeth Elliot internalized Amy Carmichael's sobering description of missionary work as simply a chance to die. Little did Elizabeth know that this would be a truth she would experience in her life soon after high school. In 1944, Elizabeth Elliot started her classes at Wheaton College. This school was the alma mater to Billy and Ruth Graham, John Piper, A.W. Tozer, and so on. Initially, Elizabeth thought she'd major in English or philosophy. Eventually, she switched to studying classical Greek to equip her in what she believed was her calling to translate the Bible into an unknown language. She jumped right into college life and participated in debate, the school newspaper, glee club, and singing lessons. Elizabeth and her mother often disagreed over Elizabeth's choice of extracurriculars and books. At times, Elizabeth came off a little too strong and stiff in her letters to her mother, but she tried to write to her mom more often and to include her in her life. Truth be told, no child can ever write or call enough to their mother's satisfaction. So if this needs to be your reminder to go check in on your mom, pause this episode and go do so right now. After her crush Paul receded into the background, Elizabeth Elliot had another love interest from her boarding school. The tall and handsome George Grinnebrow started pursuing her. They dated early on in her time in college, but she ultimately ended up not being able to stand him despite everyone else's approval of him. She wrote in her journal after one interaction, saw Gio this afternoon. He called me tonight for a date. I just can't stand him, but I don't know how to ditch him gracefully. Eventually, she found a way to break things off, gracefully or not. At Wheaton College, Elizabeth Elliot had found another mentor in Miss Cumming, her dorm mother. Miss Cumming helped Elizabeth see how her somewhat closed-off personality and aloofness might cause her to miss the right guy. Elizabeth was inherently reserved. She was an introvert with abrupt behavior that could easily be misinterpreted and turn people away. In reality, she cared deeply for others, but wasn't always able to express it. After a few years passed, she wrote in one of her journals, Here I am, 21 and no prospect of marriage. However, that was not to last for long. Elizabeth's younger brother had a roommate named Jim Elliott, who started to become good friends with Elizabeth. Jim was an outgoing college guy who was an incredibly talented wrestler, 
a persuasive public speaker, and a very zealous believer. In his first three years at Wheaton College, a lot of his peers actually found him pretty difficult to be around. His disdain for the superficiality of Americanized Christianity and his desire to live a radical life for Jesus came off too strong for some. He was convinced he would be celibate for all his life, telling everyone that God's higher calling for Christians was singleness because that way the worldly obligations of needing a house and physical things for children could be avoided. In hindsight, his blunt statements make some sense, as he was ultimately headed for the dangerous mission field. But more often than not, people's initial negative impressions of Jim Elliott stemmed not so much from what he said as much as how he said it. This all changed his senior year when he realized God wanted him to enjoy life and experience freedom too, and not just close himself off to everything. Jim and Elizabeth connected through their mutual refusal to accept the conventional Christian life and comfortable worldview of American Protestantism. Despite their connection, Elizabeth found herself agonizing over her unknown future at the end of college. Jim was not being straightforward about whether or not they would get married, as he was still wrestling between his feelings for Elizabeth and his preference to go to the dangerous mission field single. With that, Elizabeth was realizing she may never see Jim again after she graduates. When she graduated college, Elizabeth went to the Prairie Bible Institute in Alberta, Canada. After that, she moved to New York, where she joined a ministry to learn Spanish and prepare her for her calling to Latin American ministry. The time in New York was rough on her. Elizabeth journaled the following words. Lonely. What do missionaries ever do who go to a foreign field alone? I don't feel much like a missionary. Lord, help. It's fascinating seeing this journal entry, knowing that only a short time later, Elizabeth would be recognized by the whole world as a celebrated missionary. She didn't know that then, but even if she somehow could have, the recognition wouldn't have motivated her, but rather her desire to be found faithful. God was preparing her through the mundane and ordinary to face extraordinary challenges. While still in New York, Elizabeth met a British missionary who told her about an untouched tribe of Indians in Ecuador named the Huarani. This missionary was praying that God would send someone to the Huarani tribe, despite their tendency to kill whoever approached them. This interaction with the missionary was when God first placed the Huarani tribe on Elizabeth's heart. Her heart already being set on Latin American people, Elizabeth decided to move to Ecuador. Jim Elliott was already in Ecuador as well, doing separate missionary work. Now that he and Elizabeth were in Ecuador together, they were able to see each other a little bit. Jim was still set on doing ministry as a single man. This created an awkward tension in their friendship, and Elizabeth found herself resorting to sarcasm to try and cloak her affections for Jim. As a missionary, Elizabeth was willing to sacrifice the pleasures of life we hold for granted. But that didn't mean she was immune to the desires common to the human heart. She was 25 years old. Four years had already passed since she journaled about having no prospect of marriage. Well, after all these years, she seemed to be no closer to marriage. The way she saw it, She was past her prime. But she reminded herself of the eternal prize ahead and pressed on. Elizabeth traveled for several days on a journey that nowadays only takes three hours by car from Quito to San Miguel in Ecuador to work with the Colorado Indians. Her mission was to learn the Colorado language and then put it into written form for the first time ever. She finally found the only known Ecuadorian who was bilingual in Spanish and Colorado. He sat with Elizabeth for hours on end and taught her pronunciations, parts of speech, and sentence structure. The progress was amazing, up until Elizabeth's helper was shot straight through the head by men who came after his property. This man had been the prayed-for key to the Colorado language. Elizabeth wrestled with how God could let him get murdered. How would the rest of his tribe get saved now? But this was only a small trial in trusting God's sovereignty in light of what still lay ahead. Elizabeth was able to find another Colorado Indian, the chief's brother, who was willing and able to help her. After nine months, Elizabeth finally had the phonetic alphabet of the Colorado language down, along with many other language charts and notes which could be used to start translating the New Testament into their language. She packed it all up in a suitcase and passed it on to the other missionaries working with the Colorado Indians. Those missionaries consulted Elizabeth's notes and started learning the language. But before they could get very far, The suitcase, with all of Elizabeth's work, was stolen. There were no copies. Her work of almost a year vanished. Elizabeth, yet again, struggled with what God was trying to do. 
with why he would allow the Colorado Indians to go longer without a Bible in their language. She never learned the reason, as is often the case with God's mysterious will. But she gave herself over to God, just like God gave his son for her life, and she pressed on. In the meantime, Jim was working in a separate part of Ecuador with his college buddy Pete Fleming, whom he persuaded to join him. Pete Fleming had a lot going for him. He was an oratorical contest champion and a good student. He was considering seminary and was engaged to a woman named Olive Ainsley before Jim asked him to join him. However, after praying about it and feeling called to Ecuador, he broke off his engagement with Olive and joined Jim as a fellow single brother and missionary in the jungles of Ecuador. Pete's breakup didn't last long. He soon found out that the seemingly celibate Jim Elliott was quite attached to Elizabeth and was practically still pursuing her. Pete then resumed his relationship with Olive. As for Jim and Elizabeth, their courtship lasted an entire five years. I'll spare you the details of it. Essentially, it boiled down to Jim being uncertain about whether or not to yield his conviction of pursuing singleness in the dangerous mission field. If there are any gentlemen listening to this podcast, do not take this as your green light to delay proposing for many years too. Even in the unlikely event that you have the excuse of living in a perilous jungle in your near future, you will find it far less dangerous to face off with the prowling jaguar than with the woman you have let on. Don't over-spiritualize things. Just propose to that god the gal. Jim Elliott's indecisiveness was certainly very difficult on Elizabeth. But finally, Jim came to his senses and accepted the idea that God might have marriage in store for him. While Elizabeth was still working with the Colorado Indians, Jim proposed to her. Although, he had one condition. That Elizabeth learned the Ecuadorian Quechua language before they got married. Elizabeth accepted. They finally married in 1953, in the city of Quito, Ecuador. As husband and wife, they finally began to do ministry together. They traveled by canoe with all of their belongings through the tumultuous rapids to a different part of the Ecuador jungle, the Puyupungu. Once they arrived, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot immediately got to work. They hosted church meetings, ran a Christian school for children, worked on construction projects, mediated Indian disputes, wrote letters, and worked on translations. After long days of work among the Indians, Jim and Elizabeth returned to sleep under the slabs of aluminum hardly long enough to cover them both, ensuring at least one of them got wet during the nightly rains. For being so rickety, their shack was quite a hospitable place, kindly hosting guests like tarantulas, earthworms, and cockroaches. But it wasn't all bad. They had a beautiful view in the jungle, and the Indians were generous with their food, bringing over armadillo legs, rodents, and wild duck. Eventually, Jim and Elizabeth passed off their ministry in Puyupungu to their missionary friends and moved to a different part of Ecuador to build themselves a house. They recently stopped using birth control and finally had a baby on the way. The house Jim built for them was beautiful and comfortable at last, but right away, Elizabeth recognized they had to hold it loosely, as tempting as it was to try to settle into it, for God could use it however he wanted. Jim was laboring to equip the Indians to learn to study the scriptures by themselves so that they could get to the point of being a self-sustaining church, without needing a missionary to guide them. He equipped young Indian believers to take charge of church meetings in both singing and preaching. It was highly unusual for the Indians to see one of their own up front. But they were learning that God could use them too. Training up the believers became Jim's main mission, and it's what he impressed upon Elizabeth. In the midst of all that they were doing, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot were frequently thinking about how to reach the violent Warani. And not only the Elliots, but their fellow missionary friends, the Macaulays, the Udarians, the Flemings, and the Saints were also praying for the Warani. In total, these five missionary families, all based in Ecuador, began planning an operation to reach the Warani together, but separately from their missional organizations, because their agencies could sometimes get bureaucratic and territorial or just concerned about their safety and thus prevent them from going in. The only motive driving these, these missionary families was to see the Warani people saved, both spiritually and physically, as they were killing each other as often as they killed outsiders. In fact, because the Warani were killing oil miners and other foreigners, there was talk that the Ecuadorian government was considering sending in the military to take care of them. That would have probably meant the end of their tribe, as the Warani were already on the verge of going extinct just from killing each other so much. Anthropologists found that about six or seven out of every ten adult deaths among the Warani were homicides, 
often driven by different family vendettas within their tribe. Warfare was their way of life. Late at night, the Warani would tell stories, teasing each other, laughing, and recounting how their ancestors were speared. They could describe where in, j- in the jungle so-and-so was speared, or how someone was hacked by a machete while sleeping in a hammock, and so on. It was a culture of spearing or being speared. All this violence and death made the Warani mission all the more urgent. In secret, the five missionary families began drawing plans to reach the Warani. While flying over the jungle on his plane, Nate Saint had spotted Warani houses made from branches and palm leaves. Finding their home was the first step in making contact. Next, they began making weekly bucket drops from a cord inside Nate's airplane, delivering gifts to the Warani. These guys came up with the same day delivery long before Amazon Prime existed. After a few bucket drops, the Warani started returning the generosity, putting a parrot, squirrels, bracelets, and cooked food at the end of the line. When they saw the plane in the sky, some of the Warani also waved and ran around excitedly. It seemed like God was opening the door for a friendly contact. The five families discussed how they should proceed to the next step, meeting the Warani in person. Elizabeth argued that she should come along with the men with her young daughter, as the Warani would be less likely to kill them upon seeing a woman and a child. But the missionaries disagreed, and in the end, it was decided that the five men would go by themselves. They also decided to not bring any guns with them, because they knew the Indians weren't ready to meet God, but they were. Nate Saint found a beach near the Warani where he could skillfully and carefully land his plane. The men flew over to the beach and set up a treehouse high off the ground. They fell asleep, waiting for the Warani to come out of the jungle. On January 6th, 1956, the Warani emerged. Two women and one man swam across the river and approached the missionaries. The men excitedly shared food with the trio while the tribe's people tried speaking with them. Then, the Warani man, whose name was later discovered to be Nankiwi, indicated he wanted to fly in the plane. Nate climbed into the small Piper PA-14 family cruiser airplane with Nankiwi and took off. They flew around the jungle with Nankiwi shouting and waving to his tribe below. Later that day, The men radioed back to their wives and informed them of the exciting progress made on their first successful contact. Their secret mission seemed to be going according to plan. Then, January 8th rolled around. The missionaries went about their business on the beach, hoping to see their newfound friends return. What they didn't know was that there was serious trouble blowing up within the Warani clan. During the previous night, Ninkiwi snuck away into the jungle with one of the Warani women, against the wishes of his clan. He already had two wives, one of whom he had speared to death. Now, Ninkiwi also wanted to marry this woman he was with, Gimari. Understandably, Gimari's brother was against it, and when Ninkiwi was seen returning alone with Gimari, her brother flew into a rage. To divert the brother's violence, Ninkiwi lied about his previous night's whereabouts. He told his clan the reason he and Gimari spent the night together alone was because the foreigners were trying to kill them. Gimari's brother, knowing only one way to resolve his anger, aroused the rage of the rest of the clan, and together, they sharpened their spears. In the morning, while the missionary men waited, prayed, and fought off bugs, the Warani warriors grabbed their spears and silently split up into groups. When they came up on the missionaries, they directed their women to come out of the jungle first and call out to the men to distract them. Two of the missionaries, Jim Elliott and Pete Fleming, excitedly headed toward the women. As the missionaries separated from each other to greet the women, hopeful about this next encounter and oblivious to the danger, the Warani warriors sprung out and launched their spears. One by one, the missionaries fell, as spears lodged into their bodies. After each man was down, the warriors finished the job by throwing more spears into their bodies and leaving them in the river. They then tore apart Nate's airplane and returned to their homes, burning them down according to their tradition after spearings. With that, they disappeared back into the jungle. In just one moment, five men were dead. Five women became widows. And nine children became fatherless. After not hearing back from the men, a search party was organized, as news quickly traveled around the world about the missing missionaries. Soon, their hardly recognizable bodies were discovered. As the wives and journals of the five missionaries would tell you, the five martyrs 
weren't some kind of super Christians. They were ordinary men dealing with individual struggles like temptation, depression, and uncertainty up until their very deaths. God chose to store and pour out his spiritual treasure through common clay pots. He glorified himself through ordinary men willing to follow and obey him even unto death. After Jim's death, Elizabeth and the other widows found themselves suddenly in the spotlight in and outside of the Christian world. This led to some uncomfortable and unhelpful attempts at reaching the widows. Some men tried writing to them to propose to them. Other people criticized and offered unsolicited advice on everything from the deaths of the missionaries to how to try and reach the Warani now. Elizabeth Elliot got the impression from all of this for years following Jim's death that Christians were pretty comfortable talking about martyrs, but uncomfortable with the suffering of those who were left behind. They couldn't resist trying to explain the suffering away. It seemed no one was comfortable with simply not knowing. For years after Jim's death, Elizabeth struggled with dreams about him. She struggled with missing his presence, his touch, and his friendship. It would be a long road. However, her most impressive accomplishment wasn't getting past the violent death of her first husband, but as you will see in a moment, it was her dedication through all the seasons of life, including the dry and unexciting days, to being faithful to Christ and continuing to live obediently. There's an exhortation in this to all of us, to continue to press on in our faithfulness even in the seemingly boring and tedious tasks of the day. Oftentimes, the big and colorful moments in people's lives come from a consistent practice of simple devotion. That devotion is more impressive than the climaxes themselves. Elizabeth continued her work with the Kishwa Indians for two more years. In the meantime, she was learning the Warani language through two Warani women who were living among the Kishwa Indians that she was ministering to. As it turns out, Wao Tidido, the language of the Warani, was unrelated to any other language on the planet. As you can imagine, this made translating it that much more difficult. Meanwhile, Elizabeth also wrote through Gates of Splendor, which detailed the operation to reach the Warani. This book was published in 1957 and became an instant bestseller. It's still regarded as one of the most influential books of the 1900s. In 1958, after a couple anxious years of trying to find a way to the Warani, Elizabeth finally saw an open door. Dayuma, one of the women teaching Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint the Warani language, eventually returned to the Warani and created an opening for them to come with her. Elizabeth went to live with the Warani with her three-year-old daughter and Rachel Saint, the sister of one of the martyred missionaries. Living with the Warani meant taking on their way of life. Elizabeth wasn't interested in changing their culture, like forcing them to wear clothes or something along those lines. She lived as they lived. Elizabeth and her young daughter, Val, ate whatever the Warani hunted with their poisonous blow darts, which on a good day might be a smoked monkey arm. When hunting didn't go well, Elizabeth hungered with the rest of them, splitting what little she found with Rachel and her daughter. She slept in a woven hammock like the rest of them, with no walls to separate her from the Indian couples getting intimate in the hammocks next to hers. In one way, it was natural for Elizabeth, Rachel, and Val to assimilate and feel one with the tribe, because many of the Warani had lost their friends and family members through spearing too. But this violent lifestyle isn't how things remained for long. In a short time, the homicide rate went down by over 90% among the Warani, even though nothing else in their lives had changed. The gospel radically transformed their social lives. The pattern of vendettas that went back over five generations were released one by one. As Elizabeth Elliot's biographer, Ellen Vaughn, put it, Many of the Wadani, including the men who had speared the missionaries, saw a new way to live. They saw that Elizabeth and Rachel did not want vengeance for the deaths of their loved ones. They saw that forgiveness was the way out of the needless cycle of dark violence that had terrorized their tribe. Many stopped spearing. They decided to follow Jesus, who was speared for their sins, and to walk on God's trail. If you think that the most challenging part of working with the Warani was adapting to their way of life in the difficult jungle and giving up everything that's familiar, you'd be wrong. Turns out, the greatest challenge Elizabeth faced was the constant and irreconcilable tension with her fellow missionary, Rachel. Rachel stubbornly believed she alone was called to translate the language, even though she knew Elizabeth was far more skilled linguistically and was picking it up faster than her. 
She left Elizabeth out of Wycliffe and Summer Institute of Linguistics efforts to translate the Warani language. Rachel also frequently put Elizabeth down for not doing things right and being culturally insensitive, in her opinion. Sometimes, it was harder for Rachel and Elizabeth to understand each other than to understand the Warani people around them. These tensions often led Elizabeth to depression and doubt. She journaled, I sometimes wonder if she's quite sane. She wonders if I am. So we go on. Two women, shut up together at the end of the world, both convinced God brought us here, both convinced we have nothing to confess, both feeling the situation hopeless. Oh, wretched woman that I am, is it possible for two who love him to be at odds and be right? These are questions I do not expect answers for. Over the years, Rachel unfortunately made a reputation for herself of being difficult to work with, and not just with Elizabeth Elliot, but with many of the translators and missionaries who came after Elizabeth. Despite her love for the Warani and God's work, her controlling and condemning ways made her a difficult partner for anyone. Ultimately, Rachel's unwillingness to work together with Elizabeth is what caused Elizabeth to separate ways with her and the Warani. In spite of these hardships, Elizabeth pressed on, taking up residence in the United States, where she would write many more books and travel all around the country, speaking to spur on other believers. Interestingly, she always declined speaking on Sunday mornings to congregations, as she saw that as a role only proper for the males in the church. Her beliefs gained her respect, and both men and women listened to her and read her books. In 1969, Elizabeth was surprised by love again. She married Addison Leitch, professor of theology at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Sadly, he died from cancer in 1973, only a few years into their marriage. In 1974, Elizabeth became an adjunct professor at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary as well. She taught a popular course entitled Christian Expression. In 1977, she married her third and final husband, a hospital chaplain named Lars Gren. Between the years 1988 and 2001, Elizabeth spoke on a daily radio program called Gateway to Joy. This was a 12-minute radio program aimed at women. She was constantly pouring herself out. Elizabeth Elliot died in Magnolia, Massachusetts on June 15, 2015, at the age of 88. In closing, I want to share this quote from Elizabeth Elliot with you. I have one desire now, to live a life with reckless abandon for the Lord, putting all my strength and energy into it. May we do the same. One way that each of us can live our lives unto the Lord is by supporting other missionaries. May I encourage you to support another missionary on a monthly basis? They need our help. Did you know that only 1% of all mission finances and only 3% of all missionaries are going to the least reached people groups of the world? For every $100,000 that evangelical Christians make, they give only $1 to the unreached missions. We can change that. Look into Global Frontier Missions where you can donate to missions to the unreached. And while you're at it, Check out the traveling team for great resources and more information regarding unreached missions. If you'd like to learn more about Elizabeth Elliot, check out Beyond the Gates of Splendor. This is a book written by her, which gives an account of the mission to the Warani people. There's also a documentary by that same name, which you can fr probably find on YouTube. I'd also recommend that you check out the 2005 movie, End of the Spear, which is also a book written by Steve Saint, one of the sons of the martyred missionaries. But most importantly, check out Ellen Vaughn's biography, Becoming Elizabeth Elliot. If you've enjoyed this episode at all, you'll enjoy her book that much more. Most of this episode is based on Ellen Vaughn's amazingly written biography. There's so much more to Elizabeth Elliot's story, I simply couldn't fit into this episode. Do yourself a favor and read her biography. Thanks so much for tuning in to Big People Mini Bios. The next episode of Big People Mini Bios will be about a humble 15th century monk from Germany who changed the world through his revolutionary convictions.